Salford Council got a bit of a shock when they turned up to their meeting today. Let's keep it going, let's give them uh, out and let's get in the faces and show them what we're about. Thanks again for turning out, great turnout, thanks so much. And what is it that's happened now that's, that's made you come out and hit the streets? Because we have a very good club. They have now refused to play the league, therefore it's got to close. Say God in love! Say God in love! Say God in love! Say God in love! Any of you ladies ever been on a demonstration before? Never. No. Never. No. no. Are you going to be coming out again for all kinds of other issues? Are we going to see you on the streets now? You're going to be getting Mohicans and coming out chucking, chucking flares and smoke bombs? There's a maybe there. There's a maybe. I had a brilliantly activist summer in 2019. I followed this lot's fight to save their club and with help from the People's Assembly, I got to ask loads of excellent people about their own political awakenings. I became an activist after I did a favour for a mate and ended up interviewing this fella, Donica McCarthy. When I was interviewing him, he just kept dropping bomb after bomb after bomb. Despite having massive democratic successes in the party and policy and reform, none of them were implemented because around the leadership is a core of corporate lobbyists who call the shots. Donica had been deputy chair of the Liberal Democrats for two years. He'd written a book about his experiences and what he learned. The head of Paddy Ashdown's office was a political lobbyist. The head of Charles Kennedy's office was a political lobbyist. The head of I mean, Clegg's office was a political lobbyist. He was saying that the UK's media has become a political instrument of the super rich. And that's caused fundamental, disastrous changes to how our democracy functions. We have got five right-wing extremist billionaires have hijacked our democracy. I interviewed him in 2015, before the Brexit vote. UKIP was created by the five billionaires. They first went for refugees, then they went for um, asylum seekers, and then they went for Bulgarians, then they went for Romanians, and then they went for East Europeans, and now they're going for EU migrants. All of us. Donica helped me to understand that if the media is being captured by the rich, there is a desperate need for real people, ordinary campaigners, to be able to get their stories out, and that was something I could do. I spent the next four years going to rallies and on demos. I broadcast live from outside of prison. I interviewed loads of celebrities and politicians and all kinds of other people who, for one reason or another, they have been caught up in situations that had forced them into activism. Just like the pensioners from Bottom Lodge. This is my favourite live stream moment. I was interviewing the actor, Ralph Little and someone crashed it. Oh, Jeremy Hunt, I don't even know quite who he is. <laughs> uh, I know Jerry, um, I'm Vivian Westwood, a fashion designer. Talking about getting crashed. Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, uh, Wilmslow Road, Manchester. Uh, it's about uh, half past five on, the, on Monday morning, and uh, we are here to cover uh, an industrial dispute. Hello everybody, uh, welcome to prison. Uh, we're in Preston today, we're covering the story of the, um, the three anti-fracking protesters uh, who are inside here uh, for sitting on a truck. Hello folks, we're live at the demo, uh, just getting ready to set off and I am here with uh, Mark McGowan, the artist taxi driver. How you doing, Mark? It's absolutely pissing down. <laughs> the Tories have brought the rain. Do you know what I mean? When is the rain going to stop? When they shut the a and &E, we did a picket line every Saturday morning outside our hospital. This morning, Saturday, 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock, week 95. So 10th, 10th of March, we'll have been there 100 weeks. They're not shutting our NHS, they're not going to privatise it, we're going to fight back. This has been about, really, damage control for them. You know, this is, this is really the neoliberal crisis. Grenfell actually has really opened up what exactly the government's philosophy and political approach has been over the last years. You can actually see it in all its absolute grubbiness. The courts admitted that the law had been wrong for 32 years, so we want them to address the people that are in jail now. OK, and if people want to find out about it, where can they go? Uh, go to the website, Jengba. Yep. Joint Enterprise Not Guilty by Association. So if you just punch Jengba in, you'll find us.
Before the Bodden Lodge campaign, I'd already interviewed two of the unlikeliest groups of activists you could imagine. This was outside the Tory party conference in Manchester in 2017. There is a crisis in policing. We've warned about it, we've been ignored. The crisis is now here. If we don't reverse the cut soon, policing will collapse. Two, just over two years notice that my pension was going up by six years. But a lot of women, a lot of women had even less than that. So I retired early at 58, expecting my state pension at 60. And then I found out by asking the DWP myself, I had no letters of communication from them. I asked them and was told I had two years, two months, and I'd have to wait till 66. The cuts to policing are having a major, major impact. Policing is in crisis, frankly. Um, we said there was going to be a problem. Theresa May told us, in no uncertain terms, we were crime wolf. We weren't crime wolf. We were pointing out there was a wolf coming. The wolf is here. Crime's going up. Police officers are leaving in their droves, stress is through the roof, the streets are being lost to the bad guys. We're not giving up and we're not going away. It was going to be a while before I could get back to the unlikely activists of Bodden Lodge. Summer 2019 was political mayhem in Westminster. A new unelected Prime Minister, a riven opposition, and a nation on the brink of Brexit. We will be having a rally here tomorrow evening at 6 p.m. and we have an incredible lineup of speakers coming down. I took the opportunity to ask a couple of people what got them started in activism. Uh, the march against the Iraq war, uh, in, uh, a million or two million people turned up and that's the first demonstration I came to in international politics. I was involved in kind of trade union issues uh, before then, but I just think that we're now at an exciting moment really. Uh, an exciting moment for our movement, but people have got to brace themselves. It's going to be really, really difficult. I was in, I was in, um, in, a, in a mental hospital. I was taking drugs in that for like quite a long time. Ended up in a mental hospital, and they had like art therapy in there. So they said, "Yeah, you should go to uni." So I think they send a certain amount of people from the mental hospital as part of the criteria back in the day, like 20 or 30 percent go directly to the art college. London might be where the power lies, but Manchester's the home of activism. It's the city that answered terrorism with flowers. I did a bit of filming at the next Manchester People's Assembly meeting. At the meeting, there's this legendary activist called Pia, and I asked her what her first activist moment was. Go on, Pia, what got you started? Probably when I was in primary school, because I went to an Orthodox Jewish primary school and only boys were able to give the, the weekly message and I made a bit of a protest in my class and I was the first girl to deliver the religious message on a Friday assembly. <laughs> Finally, I got to Bodden Lodge. I just couldn't wait to find out how they'd got on. It was absolutely fantastic. We got a good turnout of, a, of over 50 people there. You know, we, we made an impact. It was a really good protest. Well, you were there, weren't you? It was really good. And there was a good turnout, and the motorists were tooting going past, which was really good. We just really wanted to show what we do do. We weren't being aggressive or anything like that. It was just to show them what we actually mm. did here and what we were going to miss if mm. they closed it. If we had laid back and moaned and groaned, the place would have closed in December. We've now got the eye and the ear of the public through our Facebook Save Bodden Lodge page and we've gone out and we've done something rather than sitting back and waiting. We've made a point and that is what has actually got us to, to this stage where we're at now. But you had a response from the council where you, you haven't had any we response before. We haven't had before, before no. no, they're, no. They're just keep popping us off. <laughs> Pretend we're not there, I think. Perhaps, yeah, you know. ignore us and we'll go away or we won't. I've only been the chair since April of this year and my hair's gone greyer, my bald patch has gone bigger, my bags have gone bigger, but on the upside, my waistline's gone slimmer. So there's always an upside to every cloud. The most thing I enjoy is the days out when we go bowling. I thoroughly enjoyed those days out because we end up very often with a, a full breakfast 
and then bowling and mm. then a dinner in the evening, yeah. which is lovely. When you've got a busload of people who are all the same age uh, and doing the things that they like doing, it's a good laugh. But... Some are foolish enough to dress up. The 16th of August 2019 was the 200th anniversary of the Peterloo Massacre. We gathered to remember an amazing moment of popular activism that was brutally suppressed by the authorities. There were three days of commemorative events planned. The city spent a million quid on a monument with no disabled access. This is Mark Todd. Because this meant so much to me, and I think it means so much to the people of Manchester, I couldn't let the issue go. I just couldn't. It's taken over my life a little bit. I've spoken to the girlfriend for about two months, but she's been brilliant. There was another event happening that evening. Well, my mother ran, her mother ran, her mother before. Red Saunders had found a way to bring the historical events of Peterloo to vibrant, shocking life. It had taken over four years and the help of over 230 volunteers to complete. I asked him what started him on his journey to activism. I saw a theatre group, what's known as in the 60s, as an agitprop theatre group. And they had white faces and they had t-shirts and jeans and they did this incredible play called John D. Muggins is Dead and For What Reason Did He Die? And it was about the Vietnam War and it just blew me away. And four months later, I joined the group called Cartoon Archetypical Slogan Theatre, and it changed my fucking life. And this is Boff Worley, ex Chumbawamba guitarist, now of the Commoners' Choir. His political awakening came at a Rock Against Racism gig in the 1970s. Uh, I went to that gig and I refused to take a Rock Against Racism badge because I thought, no, I don't believe in that, you know, I'm a racist. And uh, within about three or four weeks after that, I kind of realised that all my musical heroes were all aligning themselves to Rock Against Racism. The Clash and the Pistols and everyone else were all kind of saying, talking about racism. And I thought, it's me that's the idiot. I'm the odd one out here. Saturday at Peterloo and the punters are on the way. I was on a stall with Penny Hicks, the convener of Manchester People's Assembly. <laughs> what got me started in politics was fighting for women's rights, so, uh, and the repeal of the Abortion Act, the attempt to repeal the Abortion Act. I stormed the Houses of Parliament with a number of other women. That was when there was only one policeman on the gate, so guilty, Your Honour. Uh, and since then, I realised that if women were going to if we're going to be liberated, we would need a much bigger change in society. So, hence why I'm so active in politics now. And I believe in collaboration, so the People's Assembly is just a fantastic movement to try and show people another world is possible. Mike Jackson, from the group Lesbians and Gays Support the Miners, turned up. Mike was the basis for one of the lead characters in the film Pride. My grandma definitely. Yeah, she was born in 1899 and she was a fierce defender of the right to vote, so this is really sort of topical. This. But in 1965, Winston Churchill died and my school was celebrating his life. And I went home and I doted on my grandma, everything she said was... And uh, I went home all excited about this and she said, Winston Churchill, Winston Churchill, I hate that man. Grandma, why, why, why? Because all school was all kind of going, you know, triumphalising the man. She said, because he sent British soldiers on British miners and murdered them. It's only panned in 1911, so she was just gone 11 years old. And that was, I just thought, oh, all that I learned at school isn't necessarily the truth. And I think that was probably a turning point for me. <laughs> After that, I legged it up to Bolton to do another stall at an event called Labour Roots with these three. Jeremy Corbyn spoke, Diane Abbott spoke. Another speaker at the event was Shadow Minister, Rebecca Long Bailey MP, Bodden Lodges in her constituency. She'd written a really strong letter in support of the Save Bodden Lodge campaign. While I was there, I caught up with an old activist mate and I asked him how he got started. My baby was born into a house full of moulds. We had to sleep her in the middle of a bedroom so that she wasn't near none of the moulds. My first Christmas with my daughter and my wife, we had no electricity, we had no hot water. Someone in the union movement told me how I could fix it. That's how I got involved in activism, or how I got started in activism, because shit was bad. By the Sunday, I was ragged. I dropped off on the bus. Steve had to wake me up. 
When I got into town, I saw this, a silent memorial for Peter who's dead, surrounding the Quaker Friends meeting house. Protesters climbed over this wall 200 years ago to escape the murderous cavalrymen. And this is the building where I interviewed Donica four and a half years ago. The official Peter Luke commemoration was started in Albert Square. After that event, shot a quick promo with Kelly, and then it was off to Bodden Lodge to see how the Elsters had got on. Had the demo worked? Had they won? Had they saved their oasis? We're safe for a little while, we hope. We've got to see the paperwork yet, but apart from that, I think we're okay. And you've never been done anything like a demonstration? Never done anything like that in your life, I've never no. even thought about it. It was a case of, look, you either protest and do it now, or in December you turn around and say, maybe we should have gone on that protest and then maybe something would have happened uh, where are we going to go now we so it, it's worked on that basis i never believed in people power but it's true when they say everybody get together and make a, a voice and people will listen to you it gets you thinking about things don't it about what you can do yeah. as a group if you yeah, want to if you really want to get yeah. something done it has been a lot of work uh, I, put myself, which I didn't intend to do, under a lot of stress. I, I've been a bit of a sod uh, at home, uh, so thanks to my family for putting up with me. <laughs> it was just one of the things that we felt we had to do because we weren't getting anywhere and we were worried about it closing. Therefore, we did it. Yeah. I'm thoroughly enjoying it. it. And, it <laughs> and we do it again. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Linda and Denise and Roy and Penny and Pia and Red and Dan and all the other activists persist not just in the hope of, but also in the expectation that their efforts can bring about change when they perceive unfairness and injustice. Today they might be fighting to save their over 60 social club, but tomorrow they could be fighting an authoritarianism that threatens all of our freedoms. Descendants of the Peterloo Martyrs, and we are coming for you. We are the descendants of the Pendle Witches, and we are coming for you. Wayward daughters, renegade sons, come to take revenge for the things you've done. We are the descendants of the Tarot Marchers and we are coming for you. We are coming for you. We are the descendants of the Suffragette Martyrs and we are coming for you. We are the descendants of Old Watt Tyler and we are coming for you. Wayward daughters, renegade sons, come to take revenge for the things you've done. Things you've done. We are the descendants of the war resistors and we are coming for you. We are coming for you. We are the descendants of the tinkers and the levelers and we are coming for you. We are the descendants of the Cable Street Fighters and we are coming for you.